Hi everyone, this is our seventh lecture of the class. We're going to be talking about model diagnostics today. The topic today really is all about what tools do we have to find reasons why our model might not have valid results. To start, it's best to really consider that uh, this may be the most important topic that you learn uh, other than just regression itself. This is how we actually come to find out if our model really has a whole lot of validity. And we need to consider all the assumptions of the model. Here, I've added two that we've talked about but haven't explicitly said that it's an assumption of the model. We have a linear relationship. That is one that we've talked about before. Homoscedasticity of residuals, we've talked about that one. Normally distributed residuals, we've talked about that one with a mean of zero. That's uh, by definition of the, the model, it's just gonna happen. The, one of them that we added was no omitted variables. We're gonna talk about why that's important again. Uh, the fifth one, independence of residuals or independence of observations. And then the last one is another one I added, is the variance of X needs to be greater than zero. The two that I added with no omitted variables, we've talked about why that's really important. Your results are not valid if there are important variables that you've left out. And you can think back to the causality lecture and when we were talking about this in terms of multiple regression, the results just aren't valid if we have left out important variables. Also, it turns out regression will not work at all if the variance of your predictors is not greater than zero. That is, if there, it's just a constant, if it's the same number all the way through, regression won't be able to do anything with that. In R, it'll just naturally drop that variable. It'll see that, oh, that's a constant. I'm just going to leave it out. Generally, violations often occur because of extreme cases. Sometimes it's just the nature of a variable. It's just really skewed or something like that. But often it can be because of extreme cases. We're gonna talk about three different ways of talking about extreme cases. There's high leverage, high distance, and high influence. We'll define each of those in turn. First one we wanna talk about is leverage. And one way that this is defined is the atypicalness of a case's pattern of values on the regressors of the model. So we're talking about the predictors here. When the predictors combined together are weird compared to other data points in your model. So some examples of some high leverage points could be a 55 year old pregnant female. So a pregnant female probably isn't all that weird in your data. And depending on your data set, a 55 year old is probably not all that weird either. But the combination of the two is rare. So it's going to have high leverage. It's going to be a point of high leverage because it doesn't happen very often. Another situation, a high income individual receiving welfare assistance. That's another case where welfare is designed for low income individuals. And so if you have someone that's a high income and receiving welfare, that's going to be what's called a high leverage point. So the way to think about this is you can think in general, is being 55 years old, is that strange? No, it's not super rare. What about being pregnant when you're a female? Not that rare. But the combination, uh, far more rare. Another, with this one, you can think in the general population is having a high income strange by itself. What about being on welfare? Both of those are fairly common. Uh, maybe high income, not so much. Regardless, together, they're really rare. So leverage, again, it's a combination of the predictors. It has nothing to do with the outcome. The outcome can be totally normal or totally weird. Doesn't matter. It's all about how atypical the combination of values of the predictors for each data point. This one is measured with what's called the cases I hat value, it's a hat value, it's a H. 
So each individual in your model will have a hat value. And we'll talk about exactly what that means in a moment. So leverage, it's measured with hat, the hat value. And it is the atypicalness of a case's pattern. Next one is distance. This one is how far is each point? How far does it deviate from what's predicted? So really it is a question of how big is the residual? So we're looking at how large, how far away an individual point is from where we actually predict them at the line. One of the issues with this measure is that if you are an outlier, you actually are going to be pulling the line towards you. So you look like less of an outlier than you really are. So there's actually a way to adjust for it. And strangely enough, you actually can use the hat value that we just talked about with leverage to adjust for it. You can use this E, so which the residual, divided by the square root of one minus the hat value. Together, that actually gives you the uh, distance without uh, letting the line move up with it. I like to call this math the magic because somehow, just because it's math, uh, you actually can see that the hat value is equal to the proportion by which case I lowers its own residual by pulling the regression surface or the line up to it. It's weird, but it's true. So the hat value is measuring basically how much uh, that point is moving the line towards it. It's proportional to that. The last one, and I'm going to hide myself for a sec, is called influence. This one is the extent to which the inclusion of that data point changes the regression solution or some aspect of it. So I want you to consider this example I have over here where we have X and Y, we have a cloud of points, but then we also have these other points that are marked out here and they're all extreme, they're outliers. But we wanna consider which one has high influence. If you think about which one's going to change the solution, or in other words, the line, which one changes the line the most if we put that point in? Is it A, B, or C? So we'll see if you were able to guess it correctly, or if you have put it together already, why it would be one or the other. So first, let's look at A. So of those three lines, we have the dark bold one, we have the thin one, and then we have the dashed one. If we were to put A in the model, which of those lines makes sense? Actually, it turns out that thin one right at the bottom, that is a line if you include A, which actually turns out to be the same line as if you didn't include A. So A in this case doesn't actually change where the line is or its slope. It'll change some things about the standard errors, but it's not actually going to change the slope. And then we can look at B, which of those two remaining lines, the dashed or the solid one, goes with B if we threw B into this data. Actually, it turns out it's a dashed one. So all it does, it doesn't actually change the slope, it just shifts the line up just a little bit. And it's kind of shocking, it doesn't shift it up very much. And that's because we have a decent sample size of dots below that. So a single data point just high above the cloud of points doesn't actually do a whole lot to the line. So what we can see so far is B and A, which are extreme in one variable, but not extreme in the other. So A is extreme in X, but it's totally normal for Y. And B, which is really normal for X, it's right where the other X points are, but really is extreme for Y. It's just one or the other. It doesn't influence the line much. But when you're C, it actually shifts the line a lot. So if you're extreme on X and Y, 
you're going to have what's called high influence. You're going to highly influence where that line is. In other words, that single point C is changing our result. There's no relationship in the data if we have every point except for C. All we do is add C and suddenly it looks like there's a relationship, there's a slope there that's greater than zero. When it comes to influence, it's gonna be measured with Cook's distance. And you've seen this before because it's one of the plots that gets output when you run the plot on your regression object in R. It's the fourth slide or the fourth uh, plot. And so uh, you've seen it before, but we just haven't defined it fully yet. Cook's distance is kind of a frustrating name in this case because it actually measures influence. It's not measuring distance as we've defined it earlier where it's just the size of the residual. What Cook's distance does is measures how influential a single point is. And it does this with this equation that we see right here. Cook's distance being equal to this d squared ij, which is the change in the value of case j's residual when case i is deleted from the model, and then we square it. So it's basically saying if we take one point out and sum up all of the change in the residual for everybody for for that point if we add it up for everyone else what it what it does when we remove that and then we divide it by the number of regressors and the variance uh which just kind of normalizes it what we end up getting is a measure of if you take that point out does it really change the model a lot or does it keep everything basically the same if the model changes a lot, where we pull this out and suddenly everyone's residuals are very different than what they were before, we're going to have a high Cook's distance, which means that that data point is very influential. It's That one point is changing the results of the whole model. If it's not highly influential, then the residuals, when you remove that one point, the line won't change very much, so the residuals really won't move and you'll have a really low Cook's D. All right, so we are going to look at an example of a pretty small sample size data set. So there's only 12 observations, so it'll be easier to kind of look through just the raw values and see any extreme points. In our in-class activity, we're gonna show how we can make plots with this data and actually find out where really crazy points are. So first, what I'm showing right here is just the raw data. So we have three predictors, x1, 2, and 3, and we have y, our outcome, and then i is just the id for each person, 1 through 12. So just looking at this data, even if you're familiar with it, you probably wouldn't see any crazy outliers. Uh, there may be some points that are higher than others, so we have Someone that scored a 17 on Y, that's the highest value, but there's someone that scored a 15 and a 13, so it doesn't seem too crazy. And someone that scored a 6, but there's also a 7 and an 8, so those don't seem very extreme from just face value. So we actually can now look at what do the residuals look like. And so this one that I labeled regular residual, that's just a residual. Uh, that you would get from running a model. So we can start to look through that and see if there's any that look particularly big. And the biggest that I see is this 3.655, which is uh, case eight. So that one may be kind of far away from everybody. Uh, that on its own isn't going to tell us a ton other than that one is not super close to the line. We also have case two, which also seems to be not all that close to the line. So you have these two points that may be kind of far away from what the model predicts them to be. So it's, let's keep that in mind. We have case eight and two that look like they could be extreme. Let's see what the other measures say about them. This next one is leverage. Remember, this one is measured with this hat value. There's also this other MD. Uh, that measures leverage in a different way. 
uh, they're related. Um, but the hat value is the one we're going to use because it's on a standard scale. It goes from 1 divided by n to 1. So if your sample size is 12, it goes from 1 twelfth to 1. And we can look through these and see which ones look most extreme. And if we look through those, it looks like maybe case 3 is the most extreme in leverage. Now if you go back, what does leverage refer to? Leverage is referring to how odd the combination of predictors are. In other words, case 3, there's something about case 3 that makes them have kind of weird values together. And we can look at x1, x1, 2, and 3 and see that for the most part, when someone scores really high on x2, they also tend to score fairly high on x3 and vice versa. For them, they, they scored an 11 on x2 and only a 5 on x3, where most people they were just they're within like one or two points, but that one isn't. So by just letting the hat measure actually tell us, we actually can go in and see why are they weird. Okay, so 3 is because their x2 and x3 are not as close as basically everyone else's. So that may be a problem. We'd want to go in and find out if that is valid, if that makes sense. So, so far we have case eight and two that have big residuals and case three that has a high leverage. And then this last one, uh, we talked about Cook's distance, which measures influence. So we can go through all of these and we can look at which one has high influence here. And if you look through these numbers, none of them are huge. You don't have any that are really far away from all the others. You have case 8 that has 0.26 and case 2 that's 0.218. So they have more influence than the others, but they're not wildly different than the others, so they may not be problematic. What's really important to note here is that case 8 and 2, we've noted a few times, they might be extreme. And case three had a high hat value. And so these are all cases that we want to look at and make sure everything about them is valid. What's really important for our model is definitely the Cook's measure. Because that one tells us, are those points changing the value of my regression? So something we're really going to want to keep in mind is case eight and two. And we might want to try a regression without those two points and just see how different our conclusions are without them. Generally, when it comes to really approaching these diagnostics and deciding what to do with the information, you wanna try things out, look at what happens with the model without these extreme cases. Does it really change it? If not, then you can say it didn't really change the model enough for our conclusions to change. Sometimes it does, and when it does, it's often best to show the results of both. If this is for a paper, sometimes people will do a supplementary table where they show the model with the points and without the points just to highlight this is how much it changes. We couldn't find any reason why their values were invalid, but they were highly influential, and so we want to show all that data.